Tourism Forum. Well, I have to say, gentlemen, that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the two of you on Straight Talk Africa. You're most welcome, Sean. Good. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you very much, too. And joining us via telephone link up from the Kenyan capital Nairobi is Sylvia Chebet, a senior reporter at Citizens Television, our affiliate station in Kenya. Thank you very much uh, for joining us, uh, Sylvia. Sylvia, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Well, later in the program, we'll give you, the audience, a chance to call and talk with our guests. The number to call is 202-619-3111. U.S. country code is one. Let me come to you uh, immediately, Kenneth. Uh, you listened, of course, uh, to uh, your fellow panelist, uh, Dr. Sang. Do you agree with uh, most of the things that he said, or would you like to contradict him somewhere? No, I, I actually agree with a lot of what my colleague has said. Um, the ICC, if you look at the Rome Treaty, uh, proceeds on the basis of general principles of international criminal law. Mm -hmm. uh, and in addition to that, uh, the ICC statute, uh, the Rome Treaty itself, is a codification of much of customary international law, uh, where you're dealing with... Uh, crimes which are covered mainly by what we call universal jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. The other underlying concept in international law uh, for the ICC treaty is what we call the principle of um, complementarity. The ICC can only proceed on the basis that there is complementarity with uh, municipal courts in the domestic uh, jurisdictions. For example, if a crime cannot be prosecuted within the domestic or what you call under municipal law, um, because it involves issues of state immunity and so forth, mm. you can then elevate that to a higher level, which is at the international level, the ICC. And that will be for parties that are state signatories and have ratified the treaty. But even then, countries such as the US, which uh, did sign the treaty but did not ratify, they should not take any actions which should go against the spirit and intentment of the treaty mm -hmm. because they are signatories. The fact that you have not ratified does not mean you can just ignore the spirit of the treaty. You have to respect that. So I fully agree with my colleague. He was on firm ground. I mean, he spoke about issues of presumption of uh, innocence. These are fundamental principles in mm -hmm. any democratic mm -hmm. uh, society. Mm -hmm. And quite right, uh, the burden of proof is always on the prosecution. And the standard of proof in these type of cases is... Um, uh, pretty high, unlike in civil procedure or uh, civil, civil litigation. In criminal litigation, the standard of proof is very high, uh, beyond reasonable doubt. Very interesting. Now, this particular case um, against uh, uh, the Kenyans, for example, right. have these charges been dropped because they are innocent, as the uh, Kenyan Deputy President uh, uh, Ruto indicated, or, in fact, is this a vacation of the charges? Well... First and foremost, uh, like my colleague pointed out, uh, the, the benefit of proof is on the prosecution to prove that we cannot uh, speak for the ICC. It will be unfair. And neither can we speak for the accused persons who are, whose charges are now dropped. Again, it will be unfair. There could be some evidence there uh, that wasn't gathered, gathered. We should look at resources that are available to the ICC to do the investigation and so forth. Mm. I think there's um, an issue of limited resources available to the ICC, uh, number one. Uh, number two, there is also the issue of uh, limited political will from a lot of states uh, to support and to collaborate in the investigative processes. So these are some of the issues which militate against the effectiveness of the court. But I think later on also in the program, uh, I will talk about um, the need perhaps to cast the net much wider mm. uh, in uh, the type of cases, the indictments that come before the court. It should give no excuse whatsoever uh, to exonerate or avoid prosecuting African leaders. They should be prosecuted, but in addition to that, uh, we should cast the net wider to other parts of the world. Uh, Europe, North America, uh, South Asia. We should. So far, the only non-African uh, indictment be brought before the court is from Georgia, and that was very recent. Mm. The rest of them are from Africa. Very interesting. Uh, Nyak, of course, uh, the, uh, the Pan-Africanist himself, uh, talk to us about uh, the perception, for example, that uh, the ICC targets Africa, really. 
Uh, and the last time I checked, uh, the ICC is made up of about of two thirds. I think a third actually of the ICC membership is from Africa. And these leaders who signed the Rome Statute did not sign it under intimidation. They were not signing it because somebody had an AK-47 pointed at them. What happened? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult uh, question uh, because uh, I believe that uh, when people talk about the ICC, I just came from Ghana. There was a conference uh, well organized by the Gimpa Institute about ICC in Africa. There was another one I attended at The Hague about ICC in Africa. And those who want to support the ICC uh, wants to present the situation such a way that what people say about the ICC is not the reality, but it is a perception. And then when we look at the facts upon which people base their point of view, the facts are against the ICC, like you said, and then uh, uh, and Kenneth just said it, most of the cases that they're prosecuting are African cases. So then people who think that the ICC is targeting Africans, you know, they're, they're justified in their assertion. But one thing I would like to add is that uh, a few, some, there are some people, and they're, they're not black, and they wrote some books. Uh, there is a, a, a white French citizen, her name is Stephanie Maupas, who wrote a book, and the title of the book is that the, uh, the ICC is a tool in the hands of the most powerful. And there is another one, Dr. David Hoyle, who published a book, a 600-page book, to demonstrate that the ICC is a broken institution. So it means that there are some justice lovers and then freedom seekers in the world, black and white, who believe that the ICC is conducting its business in a very partial way, and then it be in Kenya or be in Ivory Coast in different parts uh, where the ICC is, is conducting its business, we see a selective prosecution which leads to a selective investigation, certainly to lead to, you know, to end with a selective justice, which is not true justice. We'll come to uh, more on that, of course, later.